All righty. Well, I feel like I'm going to go ahead and get started because I want to respect your time. And I'm going to start off with a quote. PowerPoint could be the most powerful tool on your computer, but it's not. It's actually a dismal failure. Almost every PowerPoint presentation sucks rotten eggs. And that quote comes from a person named Seth Godin who wrote a book called Really Bad PowerPoint. And the whole gist of the book is he takes you through and shows you poor examples of PowerPoint presentations and how to improve them. So I hope you don't feel that way about my presentation. I hope you're not gonna come away thinking that it sucks rotten eggs, but I do feel like this gentleman has a point. So have you ever given a PowerPoint presentation that was a disaster? A presentation that when you were finished with it, you said, I could have done better because I, I'm speaking for myself. I know I have done that. And there are a lot of times when we're asked to give a lesson on how to do something to our colleagues. And what do we do? We sit down or I'll speak for myself. I sit down and pull out the best examples I, I have on how I can do something because not only do we want to shine, but we want to showcase best practice examples and that's fine. But the reality of it is for most of us, if you're going to achieve any kind of skill with something, you often create a lot of, as Seth would say, rotten eggs before you start creating gems. So we're going to take a different approach to our discussion today. I'm going to show you some rotten eggs, some things that I did that were not best practices before I began creating presentation gems. And I probably oversold gems because it's probably not gems here today, but I, I hope you don't leave this thinking that it's a rotten egg. So have you ever given a conference talk where somebody walked out of your presentation? I had that happen to me. And this is even though I've come from a background where I did a lot of public speaking when I was younger. I probably gave my first public speaking assignment when I was like seven years old. So it's not ever been anything that I've been afraid of, but there were still lessons that I had to absorb as a professional to improve my presentation skills. And I had to learn those skills to give a presentation that was clear, something that was to the point and something that grabs the listener. I've given a PowerPoint presentation before where it came time and I was clicking on the slides with the images and I happened to catch a glance at an audience member's face and they were looking at the image and then looking at me because they were puzzled. They were clearly puzzled by the image that I selected. So I had to learn to refine my presentations and it's really studying the art of drafting, studying the art of revising, editing your words, editing the visuals so that your talking points are complementing your message rather than competing with what you're saying or confusing the listener. These were lessons that I had to absorb. I had to learn the appropriate use of font and colors to grab the listener. And I also had to learn to weave in storytelling elements, put a little bit of myself on the line because we're driven by storytelling the same way our ancestors are. That's what we do as humans, we tell stories. So the bottom line is nobody wants to feel unsure as to whether they've done the best job that they can when it comes to developing an effective presentation, when it comes to developing an effective lesson. And you don't wanna bore your audience. You don't wanna feel like you've wasted their time. You also want to develop something and deliver something that's interesting. So it's important for you from a student engagement perspective, and it's also important for you when it comes to speaking to colleagues like I'm doing today, because you want them to thoroughly understand your point and why it matters. So I'm coming to you with experience, and no matter what level you're at, a lot of you are probably very seasoned public speakers. Others may just want a few pointers, and still others might be terrified of public speaking. I've come armed with some information to help you to give effective presentations and lessons. So I already know a lot of you all. If you don't know me, my name is Michelle Knight. I'm an instructional designer. I work for Elite. And I wanna thank you for choosing this particular workshop because you have other ones that you could have chosen from for during this period. And I always appreciate when people spend time in my sessions and I promise I will try to make it as worth your while as possible. So Aristotle, he gave a quote on public speaking, which said, 
tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. I'm sure there's not, most of you all in here have heard this quote. So I'm going to do that right now. I'm going to share with you what we're going through today and the outline of our workshop. So first, we're going to review the processes for preparing effective presentations and lessons. Secondly, we're going to talk about strategies for how to use images in presentations. We're going to consider presentation design elements like color, topography, and slide layout. And lastly, we're going to discuss methods for structuring effective lessons. And I want you all to participate in this. There's like 30 of you in here and you all are seasoned instructors. I'm going to give you the opportunity to have the floor and share your insights with your colleagues. So I have about 30 minutes worth of material. Um, I'm going to ask if you have questions during this first part, just go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, and then we'll have time at the end to discuss your questions and also for you to share. Are there things I left out? Are there things that are important that you want to share? And I also want to tell you one more thing, and that is that I've created a great handout, which I'll share with you all, that has my talking points. I don't want you to feel like you have to scurry and write down every little thing that I say, because most of what I'm telling you today, in fact, all of it is going to be on a website that I'll share with you at the end. So hopefully everyone is on board with this right now and everybody feels good. So let's start with the process for preparing an effective presentation or lesson. And we're not talking about how to use tools today, how to use PowerPoint, how to use Prezi or Haiku Deck or any of the other tools. What we're talking about is just the process for planning and organizing a presentation. And so my first tip for turning rotten eggs into gems, you want to start by planning your presentation outside of PowerPoint. And if you are working with PowerPoint, you wanna start with the speaker notes only, okay? So throughout this whole presentation, I'm gonna give you these little insights, these insights on how I've turned rotten eggs, if, in case you've already figured out, things that I were, were doing before that were not in my best interest or didn't help my presentations to shine, how I've turned these things into things that are a lot better. Um, so I want you to take note of these concepts because I'm going to ask you about these concepts at the end, what you thought of them and how to apply them and so on. So I used to be one of those people who I opened up my PowerPoint and I started planning my presentation right away. And I think if I probably polled you guys, that's probably what a lot of you all probably do. You open your PowerPoint and you start designing those slides immediately. But I would encourage you all to take a step back and start by storyboarding or planning what you're going to say and even though i'm a great technologist and love technology there are a lot of low-tech tools that are good for this so you got index cards and you can write down what you're going to say on each one of your index cards and just at this point concentrating on what you're saying not your images not the text to support it and I like index cards too, because you can move them around if you need to as you're developing your talk. Now, I teach a method of presentation design, which I'll talk about a little later, called Petra Kucha to Faculty. And when I teach them this, I give them index cards and you all spend time planning your presentation using these index cards. And for all of them, that's like a revelation. They like using that technique. There are other techniques you can use. You can just open up a blank PowerPoint and you can plan what you're gonna say in a speaker notes field. That's how I plan this presentation I'm giving to you today. And when I start, I'm not fooling around with the images. I'm not worried about what's going on the presentation. All I'm doing is getting out my outline, my talking points, my script, however you wanna look at that. And then I also like that because when you're not committing things to how you have designed that PowerPoint, it's a lot easier for you to move things around because you're not as invested in it at this point. So after you've written the outline, the next thing you need to do is figure out how you're gonna structure that presentation in a way that's gonna engage the listener and help them take away the key points that they need to gather from your presentation. So there's nobody among us 
who would turn in a journal article where you hadn't changed the order of some of the sentences or sections, or if you write grants, some of y'all might write grants, you probably do a lot of editing as to where the paragraphs are, the sentences are, and so forth. So the same thing applies when you're developing a presentation. You need to order the flow so that it serves your audience. And so when you're doing that, you'll find as you're developing these presentations, the best way to organize it is often not linear or the order in which you originally wrote your talking points or the order in which they initially come to you. So that's my next rotten egg in the gym. You wanna think about how, you shaping your how you're shaping your narrative and how you're gonna order your presentation so it's the most effective. So I'm gonna be honest, full disclosure here, I used to organize my presentations and I didn't give a lot of thought into how I was shaping my narrative. I write the presentation from start to finish and I pretty much do my practicing and my delivery in the same order that I created my slides. So I'm gonna give you some better ways to approach this. Now that way that I just said, just writing it out and, and organizing it that way, that is called a pyramid. And that's the typical way people organize presentations. It's the way most people do it. You put your introductory information first, you support it with details, and you give them a conclusion. But the problem is that the most interesting part of your presentation is the conclusion. So you're gonna have your audience attention. It's gonna wane throughout and only to pick up at the end. Now, a lot of people have gotten hip to the idea that people's attention, they wane while they're waiting for that, bam, big conclusion. So you'll notice your evening news, they've gotten hip to that. They give you the conclusion first. When you turn on the news, the headline, that's what's first, that's the most important. And then they give you information in decreasing importance or news articles, they're often written this way. But the problem with that is all your important information is right there up at the front. And so then you've got people whose attention is right there at the top, and then it's going to fade as they go throughout the presentation. So a lot of times, especially if you're a faculty member, you're working with details that need to be presented in a linear fashion. OK, and so if that's the case, then I encourage you to do this hourglass approach. So you're going to start with a preview and set expectation about what the topic is that you're going over. You're going to support your preview with those details. And then at the end, you're going to have those conclusions and those takeaways. What's your mission statement? What do you want students to do with the information that you're giving them? Um, that's the best way really to structure it if you have information that needs to be done in a linear fashion. So another way you can organize your presentations is problem and solution. So if you're using this method, this is what you do. You're going to frame what the problem is. You're going to show why it's a problem and then your presentation becomes solving that problem. So that's kind of the approach that I've taken with this presentation. I'm presenting to you the problems with how we typically develop presentations and plan them and how to solve those problems. Another way you could organize your presentation is with storytelling, the storytelling approach and um, the stories, they always work because we as human beings, we're hardwired to listen to stories. We're hardwired to engage with stories. So if you're able to weave in some type of storytelling elements in your presentation, it's going to help your content to shine. And the stories don't have to be funny and they don't have to be emotional. They just need to relate to your content and advance what you're saying. And I did that a little bit in the beginning when I put myself on the line. But my favorite method by far for all of these is the Pecha Kucha method. And Pecha Kucha, the word is Japanese for chit chat, and it consists of developing 20 slides and you speak for 20 seconds about each slide. So you're going to have a presentation at six minutes and 40 seconds, and then you set the slides to automatically advance so you can't cheat. Now, I am really devoted to this method, and I'm going to tell you that much of what I've learned since I've been an adult that has improved my public speaking has come from this method. So I encourage you to try it. You may not be able to be getting it down to the 20 slides and 20 seconds per slide initially, but it will help you get a lot of skills, including speaking concisely, using those compelling images, and also framing that presentation. So you're really, you're telling a story. 
There are other ways you can arrange presentations, but I think you'll get a lot of mileage out of Hourglass and Problem Solution and Pecha Kucha and Storytelling. And if there are other methods you're curious, you wanna explore, you can just Google presentation structure. There are a lot of ways to do it and it doesn't just have to be linear. So that was a big eye opener for me, okay? So once you've planned your presentations and you use your index cards and you figured out how am I gonna organize it, now it's time to plan the images that support your presentation. So here's my next tip. Begin brainstorming effective images before you sit at the computer. So I'm going to confess, I used to put images in my presentation as an afterthought. They were like a garnish. Like when I was a teenager, I loved the Olive Garden. And so, you know, they have those little garnishes on your plate, but they're not useful. They just make things look pretty and you don't eat them. That's the same way I was treating my images. They were not really advancing my story. They weren't contributing much to what I was saying, except being decorations. So in order to be able to use these images and try to start thinking of them as a focal point, as counterintuitive as it sounds, I had to step away from PowerPoint, step away from the computer and just sit down with a piece of paper and think, oh, what do I need on this slide? Like, for example, what goes on this slide? Well, I'm telling people to write down things before they sit at the computer. He needs some sticky notes, things like that. Um, if you're an artist, this is even better. You can actually sketch things. But I guess my point is getting away from the computer, it actually yields more creative ideas rather than just sticking a placeholder image there because it's pretty. And you want to avoid that standard generic clip art. So that's another reason to start brainstorming before you are actually sitting at the computer. Then... I want to encourage you to remember that expression. There's no one among us who does not know the expression, one picture is worth a thousand words. And you can use that to your advantage with the audience because your audience, your students, they're going to remember pictures a lot better than they remember words. So you want to use these visuals in support of your message and keep it sparse. Anything that's not going to contribute to them learning your information, you can remove it because you're your goal is to reduce the visual clutter. And then also, if you can pick images that reach out and grab people and resonate with their emotions, it's going to be memorable. And it's going to do the most important thing, which is reinforce your points so that learning can occur. One other thing that I had to grasp was that a person cannot read your PowerPoint slide and listen to you at the same time. So that's another reason to use images and text sparingly to support that narrative. Next, there are only a few more rotten eggs to gems. Where possible, use full screen images. So the large full screen images, they serve the purpose of capturing the attention of your audience and they put the focus on the visuals that are actually supporting what you're gonna say. And also because you're using them at full screen, people can see it. Now that slide right there in the right-hand corner in case you couldn't tell is a slide from one of my own older presentations. I want you to look at how small those images are and how hard it is for the audience to see that. And what you're looking at is images that I captured for from a training manual. And that was one of those moments where I was off giving my PowerPoint presentation and somebody was squinting, trying to figure out what they were looking at. It would have been better for me to take those four images from the training manual and put them on separate slides, even if they weren't up there for long, because that way the people could see what I was talking about and it would resonate with them. And when I'm telling you to use these full screen images, what you're really doing, you're, you're capitalizing on a lot of the things that make a documentary compelling or what makes a movie compelling. And I would argue that giving a good presentation has a lot more to do with what makes you engage when you're watching a documentary than having a static PowerPoint that's just filled with bullets. I'm not saying that you can't use bullets, but I am saying that you want to remember that you don't have to put the takeaways that your audience needs 
in the PowerPoint. You can create a small separate handout to give them that detailed information. That's what I do now. I don't give them my PowerPoint. I normally give them a handout. And I'm going to share one with you later so you can see what I mean. Now, when we're talking about bullets, that's normally what we see when we do the PowerPoint presentations, but you don't have to do that because that's what we're used to. Because bullets, they're often not a good medium for people to grasp or remember your message. And a lot of things that you're doing as bullets, you can do on a handout where bullets are, are great. Um, and it also, if you are gonna use bullets, I'm not telling you not to do, use bullets. I had a few bullets in this presentation, but you should use them after you've carefully considered, okay, the bullets, this is a list of information. It's a true list. This is the best way, like my learning objective to get this port. These are a, a list of things that people need to remember. This is the best way to do it. And if you're gonna use them, use it sparingly and not on every slide. Uh, so, that's my rotten egg to gym number five. Don't fill up the entire presentation with just slide after slide filled up with bullets. That's an example from a presentation I actually gave. And what was wrong with this was that my speaking points, my talking points, whatever you wanna call them, they were on the, that slide as bullets. And so there's far too much text on that slide. It's competing with me and what I, I was, I'm saying, and that was what was on the screen when I had somebody, thankfully there's only been one person, that was what was on the screen when that person walked out of my room. I remember it. So learn from that um, and think about not filling it all up with bullets because it's not really gonna support what you're saying. Now, with text on the screen, um, you see I have font choices on the left, I have these fonts that are called sans serif fonts. So these are the fonts that are used on signs, billboards. You're driving down 270, you're driving down 495. That's what you see. You see Calibri, you see Helvetica, you see Arial. And that's because those are things you have to quickly glance at and draw your attention to. On the right, you see these serif fonts. So that's like Times New Roman, Garmin, and Georgia. Those are fonts where like the book that you read before you go to bed on your night table, that's the kind of fonts they are. So if you're gonna use fonts with the PowerPoint, use the choices on the left because they're easier to read at a glance is the bottom line. So now we've come to our last rotten egg to gym. Practice makes perfect. I would advise you, and I know you're faculty, and so you, you have a limited amount of time, but I would still get that presentation as much in your head as you can until you feel sick of it and then rehearse some more. I'm telling you that because when you look at speakers who are really good at public speaking, Martin Luther King Jr., Oprah Winfrey, Steve Jobs, Barack and Michelle Obama, one thing they have in common is that that delivery they're doing, it seems effortless. It does seem counterintuitive, but in order to get, in order to get comfort and facility with a presentation, you almost have to practice it to the point where you know it really thoroughly because that's going to let you connect with the audience. That's going to let you take those side avenues if you need to take them. That's going to let you engage with them, joke with them and so forth. Because when you really think about it, the fear of public speaking, it comes down to being afraid that you don't know your material. So if you can get that material in your head, then you don't have that fear. And then you're able to connect on a deeper level and breathe life into what it is that you're presenting. So now we've come to my favorite part. I'm gonna get a little bit more interactive with you all. I wanna ask you a few questions. I'm gonna ask you, what are your two favorite ways that I was able to turn rotten eggs into gems in these presentations? And then what egg do you feel is most difficult to turn into a gym in your own experience and why. So I put the eggs up there so you guys could see it. And now I'm gonna turn it over to you. You guys can unmute yourself. And what are some of your favorite ways that you feel like you can improve presentations? Some of those pointers that I shared. Less words, more pictures. Yeah, I think that's a really good one. I do. 
rehearsing the presentation. I do it all the time to make sure that I can get my lecture done in a specific time. So then we can do our active learning activity in class as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Heather Brown, you've got a good, um, or actually Ann Smith, I'm sorry, you've got a really good point too. The hardest is giving up the bullets and the use of many words. It is so hard. That is really hard to do. It is extremely hard to do. Um, I think the best, yep, Nahir has a good um, thing in the chat. He says, I use an outline instead of bullets. That's the key. You got to kind of transition a lot of that meat that you would put on those slides into the, um, the speaker notes or your notes, a piece of paper, what have you. Um, Sherry, I know it does sound like diverting from bullets will be difficult and it can be, and I'm not telling you never to use them. I'm not saying that, but I do think that um, where you can, I would encourage you to um, back up from, from, from using bullets all the time. Heather says, why is an outline better than bullets? You can um, give people notes, um, bullets, in a note, but I'm just saying that think about yourself when you're listening to a presentation somebody's got a series of bullets on the screen. You can't both read them. And listen to what that person is saying you just can't do it. I have a question i'm not sure I understand. I think it's Petra <laughs> Kua. I'm Petra Kucha. Sure. Petra Kucha. Okay. All right. Um, I'm not sure really what you're getting at. So are you saying that really the best thing to do is to try to cover 20 slides, 20 seconds for each slide? But I'm not, is that what you're saying there? And I'm not understanding how chit chat falls in place there. Well, the Petra Kucha, it's the chit chat piece. It just simply means that's what Petra Kucha means in Japanese. And it's, it's a way that um, actually it was developed by a, a Jack, Japanese architectural firm to help their, um, their architects be better public speakers. And so the premise of it is you have 20 slides and you speak for 20 seconds about each slide. And so that was one of the methodologies I presented to you for being able to organize a presentation doesn't mean you have to use it. Okay, but it is something that you can do. And for me, it made me a better public speaker. They actually have Petra Kucha nights. They have them. They have one in Silver Spring. And so it's kind of like you go there and you can listen to people do this or you can deliver one of them and it's on a sp certain topic. So it might be like uh, 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 Need, uh, news media and, and, and stories or Black Lives Matter, it would be anything. And you just do that presentation on that and you're limited into that format. Um, da, 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 da. Sherry, yes, the Petra Kucha method is not for everything. That's why I presented a lot of other methods like the hook in the preview, um, the storytelling, right? The problem solution. I didn't use Petra Kucha for this. I talked to you guys for 25 minutes. That was kind of, I organized it like problem solution. These are the problems that we typically have. Here's how to solve them. Uh, and also remember, you could do multiple Pecha Kuchas. Keep that in mind as well. Um, I use the outline view in Word. Steve, that's actually a good, um, a very good way to do it. I use the outline view in Word to start my PowerPoints and then import it into PowerPoint. That's actually a very good way to do it. I think for me, the key is getting away from the PowerPoint because then you spend so much time designing the PowerPoint. It's almost like you're writing what you say to serve those slides that you've made. At least that used to be for me. Um, yeah, and I hear there are plenty of videos of people doing Petra Kucha. That's really a good idea. I should have just told you that in here. That's why you all are here to learn from each other. You can put that in YouTube and find a lot of uh, people doing those. Um, Merlina. Michelle, oh, Michelle, this not come up in your presentation, but um, I was doing a presentation yesterday and 
and what the audience member says, but I can see your, I can see your, the slide that is coming now and I can see your notes. And I was in the presenter's mode. I didn't know that, that they could see my, my notes and what was coming next. How, how do you hide that? Well, for me, I have two screens and I always do. So but yeah, but my about notes, one screen. I mean, you know, if you got one screen, if you can see the notes, they can see the notes. You know, the best way to do that in my mind, what I used to do when I had one screen, um, I would have my notes like on my iPad or my phone, right? And refer to that. But you gotta make sure when, you, when you're when you presenting it, you're just presenting the PowerPoint itself. So if, if I were you, I would have the notes somewhere else and then project my PowerPoint. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Don't show your speaker notes is basically what I'm trying to say. Just show your presentation itself. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Speaker notes you can use your phone or something else for. What did you say? Yeah, it thanks. Well, I thought there was a work around or wrong it, but thanks. No, there's not because there's not because you're showing whatever is on your screen when you're in the Zoom, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I refer to the speaker notes, but I have a second screen. That's what I do, Rochelle. Um, Shantae says, that's why I don't use the speaker notes section. That's a good point. I don't always use it. Sometimes I do, but I guess my point is your notes need to be in something, right? Yeah. And not the bullets of the PowerPoint. Uh, let's see, what else? Um, Merlina brings up a good point. Brainstorming effective images before sitting at my computer is tough for me. Um, why do you think that, Merlina? Do you feel comfortable elaborating? I know that images are essential, especially this generation. They love to see things on screen, but I don't know my brain. I'm so used to the old ways of doing things that it's hard to think about images first. Um, I got you. But I, that's something that I really want to work on because it, they are effective. They are absolutely effective. I got you. I got you. I think for me, the, the biggest piece is if I'm writing a script first or whatever you want to call it, speaker notes, um, bullet points, whatever you want to call what we're talking about is our narrative for our presentation. They inform your images. Right. Let me see if I can't go back and think about some of these. That makes sense. Yep. They inform it. So when you're letting it do the informing for you. So like, for example, I knew I was going to go with this, um, this rotten eggs to gems motif. Right. And I, I came up with that because of Seth Godin and his quote. Right. And so for me, then these little things like I know I need something that showcases that practice makes perfect that becomes my image. Do you know what I mean? So really my script is what's giving me what my images are. In some cases, you're going to have to show like what it is. Like, like I had the, the font choices. Obviously, that's the best way to do that. Just like actually put the fonts what they are. But in other cases, like when I wanted to talk about how a lot of what we do with pre presentation has to do with filmography, then I just I want a camera. Um, Let's see. Uh, or the picture is worth a thousand words. I was like, I got to be able to find something where I can just showcase like a thousand, like it looks like, you know, like kind of how like 20th Century Fox, is that right? 20, 20th Century Fox, something that looks like that. You know what I mean? So that is, Shantae, yes, use your words first and then add an image if it complements your point. Exactly. Because the images are really going to be what people remember. Shell, um, what I end up doing, is I teach automotive technology. And so mm -hmm. I have pictures that I have taken in the shop. And so for me, it becomes, I, I actually kind of do it a little bit backwards. I have an image that I want that demonstrates what I want to talk about. And then I kind of make the narrative to follow the image. And I realize that's sort of backwards of what you're talking about. But I think in a situation like mine, that, that works well for me. I'm not saying what you're saying is, is I, I like what you're saying, but I, I think there are examples on both ends of the spectrum that can work either way. Follow what I'm right. saying? Right, 
Absolutely. And I don't think that's a bad thing. Like, absolutely. If you're a medical, if you're teaching, like, I can see how even like if you taught, um, you know, those DMS faculty and things like that, and they have those, um, those images, those body images and things like that, that they need to teach people. I can see how you could have 20 of those images and be like, okay, I need to develop a presentation or a lesson around those. Absolutely. 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 I'm not trying to be hard and fast um, with any of this, just a few pointers that have helped me along the way. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. Oh, you know what, guys, while I while we're talking in this chat, I'm going to sh share with you the takeaway website I have. And then we're going to talk about effective lessons really quick. This takeaway website in that website, and I'll actually um, jump forward and visit it real quick so I can show you. Um, and then I'll go backwards. This takeaway website, I have some um, resources you can use in terms of presentation planning. It's all on here. Um, and also I have some places where you can find images for free. So um, photos for class is a good one. Pixabay, Unsplash, you guys probably know all that. Um, Pexels, I'm always on Pexels. <laughs> I need to get off of Excel. Um, a list of free image sites, which was just a whole bunch of them that were aggregated. Um, so use that. Absolutely feel free to use that um, takeaway uh, website. Um, Can you? I, I, I sent, I put the link in the chat. Okay. Yep, and I will send it to you guys. Um, but I put the link in the chat, so you should be able to grab it right there. And I'll put it up again at the end. Um, let me go back here. Anything else that you guys want to share when it comes to um, thinking about turning rotten eggs into gems? Maybe you have your own rotten eggs, too, um, <laughs> that you've turned into gems or <laughs> that kind of thing. Yeah, I have a question, um, and this might be a topic for another presentation, but I have real trouble trying to um, separate like my material, like my lecture notes and my lesson plan for the day. Does anybody have like a great way to to separate those out? Because I have like I'll have a blurb about Elvis Presley, and then I'll have like this is the activity we're going to do with Elvis Presley, and. Can you ask that question one more time? I lost I lost you halfway. Through. Sorry, because um, we were talking about outlines. I'm trying to find a good way to separate my lecture notes from a lesson plan. I have both of them mashed together um, and I don't like just using one or the other. I, like I need to have my lecture notes because I teach so many subjects every semester, mm -hmm. but um, I don't have a good format for a lesson plan either. Um, does, does, has anyone found a good way to um, either combine them or do them separately or maybe this is a topic for another another professional development. I mean, for me, I would start like if my topic is a house, then that would be the topic and then everything underneath of it would be how I break down describing my topic so it would be you know bedroom bathroom basement living room. Does that make sense? So it's like you start with your topic and then you have everything broken down with more descriptors. Is that an answer to your question? Not quite. I mean, that would get me an outline, but then I need a lesson plan for the day. You know, what are oh, so we doing you're, first? You're, yeah. Oh, so you're talking about your actual lecture would be introducing the objectives and then maybe an activity and then maybe a lecture to strengthen the activity and then maybe uh an exit ticket so that you can Correct. figure out yeah stuff like that okay right but i've got it all mushed together in one you know and then as i change my lesson plan slightly for the day then i i can't find you know the the outline or the lecture note for that topic yeah your lesson plan should be for you planning your lesson privately. Your lecture notes should be Which based on the lecture, the lesson plan communicating to your students. So your lesson plan is for you as the educator. 
that should not be shared with your students. Your lecture notes are going to be based off the information that you have planned for your lesson. So the lesson plan is actually a planning tool for you. Um, and those should be kept separately. So one informs the other. However, the lecture notes are going to be used to communicate the important points from the lesson. I oh, would that use, was sorry. Great. That was great. I would, I would use, or what I do is when I do my lesson plan, I start with three columns. In one is what I do at the beginning, in the middle, at the end, like a warm up activities uh, for me, because later on I have to send that information to my supervisors. Then yes. another column, but this document is for my information. Yes. And in the, in the following column, I write down the activities that I am going to do in order to fulfill those mm -hmm. stages. And then in another column, I use I write down uh, resources that I'm going to use, uh, what I'm going to find, what kind of, uh, of uh, image I want, or which uh, link to any website or video or listening. So that's what how I organize uh, the lesson plan for me. Uh, later on is when I separate the just the lesson plan and send it to my supervisor. You can always go on any type of uh, graduate education website and they probably have templates that might suit your need. You can always modify them to suit your need, but that lesson plan is a planning tool for you. And then you make that um, lesson plan and then broaden it out for your lecture notes to communicate with your students so you know what you're doing. So it's a planning tool for you. So you, you should always keep them separate. Your, your students should not know what your lesson plan is. That's only for, for a planning tool for yourself. I think you got some good advice here. So I just want to hop in really quick and talk a little bit about effective lesson structure. And I want you guys to continue sharing like you just did there because you guys are the experts, okay? Um, I'm here to share information. I'm here to be a catalyst, but you guys also are the experts, okay? So I'm going to share with you a little bit about this framework for an effective lesson. You guys do lessons all the time. It's not my goal to be prescriptive in my comments here. I'm just going to share with you. It, it comes from a book called The Psychology of Teaching and Learning. And the person who wrote it, you guys probably already know because I did a lot of studying about this kind of stuff in my graduate degree, Manuel Martinez Pons. So you guys are probably all familiar with this framework, introduction, exposition, clarification, enactment, feedback, transfer, and deliberate practice. So um, he posits that these seven things should be in all effective lessons. So you got introduction, you're explaining the objectives and giving, I guess, the lay of the land to motivate the students. So we did that together today. You have your exposition. So that's you as a faculty member presenting the main subject matter of the lesson. It doesn't have to be that you talk to the person for 30 minutes, even like I did. It could be that you are flipping the classroom. You could even be giving them something to do outside of class before they come. But the point is somewhere they're getting the main subject matter. And then you have clarification. So that's your discussion piece. You are letting your students ask you questions you're asking questions of them and so on. You have enactment. That's the active learning. That's where the student is practicing what they've been taught to do. You have feedback. So perhaps like going back to number four, if, for example, we were in the classroom and I said, OK, will you guys design a few slides of a um, PowerPoint presentation or revise a piece of one of your um, lessons for lesson planning, that would be you guys doing that that active learning piece. And then maybe I would go around or one of your fellow um, instructors, because you guys do this all the time, you give hints, suggestions, correction, um, you encourage self-reflection. The transfer, so that would be helping somebody think beyond the immediate task and think about ways to apply learning beyond their lesson. So I tried to do that in the sense of asking you, 
what do you think is some of the best ways to use what we talked about with the um the presentation eggs and presentation gems what's some of the best ways to use it what are some things that are the most difficult and then lastly deliberate practice and that would be and that's actually my favorite piece of this kind of learning um what are you going to do with it later um give them a lesson or a, um, I'm sorry, a practical assignment where they can apply what's going on with the lesson. So maybe if you're a nutrition faculty and you have that student going around um, learning about nutrition labels, could they plan a healthy meal, for example, that fits in certain guidelines? And so those are the seven um, things that can contribute to having an effective lesson. So I guess now at this point i want to open it back up to you guys and your insights um what are some methods that you found most helpful in structuring successful lessons did he get it does he have it is there anything you think should be added or shared uh, uh i have a question may i know yep. what we are what we are teaching i'm teaching language uh, I don't know if it is the same for everybody. Uh, um, I, I'm an ESOL teacher. So if you would like to, if you would like to type um, what you all, it'll be it'll be too much for everybody just to shout out probably what they're learning. But if, feel free to in the chat let it be known what subject you're teaching. That would be great. If you guys want to use the chat, you got algebra, you got ESOL, you got nursing illustration and math, biology, microbiology, hospitality, biology and environmental health, history, business, chem chemistry, ELAP, communication, router switches, and digital tools. You got a good cross section here, math, automotive tech, So what do you guys think? What are some methods that you find that are helpful in structuring your lesson? Do you think this guy has it? Is he right? Is he on target? Anything you want to add? You're you're somebody's um not you're you're muted, I think. Uh Is he on target? Yes, no, I'm gonna go back to the, um, I'll go back to his. Um... Michelle? Yes. Um, I don't know, you know, I've, I've only been doing this for like say about two and a half years now. And uh, I mean, I taught a little bit before, but I was a tech for 37 years. And so I've done a lot of stuff, teaching type stuff outside of the education world, but now here I am. Um, one of the things, is that I find myself constantly having to look over what I'm doing because, for example, last semester I had a student and we were doing in the steering and suspension. And part of what they have to be able to do is identify components. It's mm -hmm. important. If you're going to work on a system, you got to know what you're dealing with. And I, I struggle because I most of the PowerPoints I use, I'm using as uh, resources that I've gotten from the textbook uh, publisher. You know, you get your instructional resources and I'll take that PowerPoint and I'll just use that as a starting point and just sort of rip it apart and put some pieces in. And, you know, that's that's kind of where I start and I work from there. So but what disturbs me is that when I have a student that's three quarters of the way of the class, and, you know, we're doing a checkout on their vehicle. And I said, OK, so, you know, we're looking at this particular set of components and it could it's a generic form that could work on multiple different vehicles. Some of these vehicles will have these components. Some of them won't. And then they say, well, these components are good. And I'm like, that's great. Why don't you show them to me? And um, so we go up underneath the car and they're pointing at the back end of a transmission and say, yeah, there's my steering box. And I'm like going, how did. And they said, well, where's, I said, where's the steering link? Coach? It's right here. Oh, well, that would actually be the drive axle. So I'm thinking, where am I missing this? How am I not being effective? Um, you know, and that's the thing I keep struggling with is how. Now, I, I did have a student that I worked with for a year and a half 
we took his engine out in spring of 20 and then we left and i we couldn't get back to it until the fall of 20 uh, fall of 20 and i spent the fall and the spring and part of the summer of 21 trying to get this engine back together so this guy could drive his pickup truck he's an older student and he's not actually going to be an automotive tech he's a cpa that's all he's ever going to be but he was interested in doing this but he he's an older student that has taken a lot of classes and he gave me some pretty valuable pointers the one thing that I, stuck with me is that he said you know what I'm an accountant, but I failed accounting in high school. And the thing that um, turned it around was I finally got an instructor who stood, you know, pounded on the basics. So that's one of the things I've tried to go back to. Um, I'm interested to see how other people handle a situation like this, where you've worked with students for almost the entire semester and some fairly basic stuff just doesn't sink in. I mean, I, I realize not every student's going to get everything, but it's happened more than once. So Shante, I guess what I'm asking is what effective presentation methods have they come up with to get this basic information out? Shantae, do you want to address what he's saying? I see you in the chat. You have some good points there. Uh, Steve, hi. Um, I think uh, constant evaluation. I, I don't know if you teach your students every week, but there should be some type of evaluation where they are giving you, they're telling you what you just told them. So it's like they're demonstrating what you just gave them so that you can correct them. No, this is not right. Or yes, this is, you're on the right path, but it has to be some, some sort of constant evaluation and you constantly redirecting them to the right answer and and i don't know if you work in like semesters or courses but it should be more than just like a midterm and a final exam it has to be like some low stake assessments mm -hmm. so that you're constantly aware of where they are in learning and you're constantly getting feedback from them because you have to correct them or you have to say you're on the right path, you keep going in this direction or just constant feedback. Um, so I teach, it's a, it's a semester long course and um, it has a lecture component uh, for that particular class. The lecture is three hours long, it's two hours and some change. Um, and then we have a lab component, uh, which is three and a half, four hours or so, something like that. So we're together for six plus hours on a weekly basis. Um, the labs, the lab exercises are designed to take what they've learned in the lecture and go out into the laboratory and actually do work on their vehicles. Um, I do break up the lecture. We will go out into the, in the auto lab um, and I will show them, look, this is, here's a vehicle, here's what it's got. You'll notice this, you'll notice that. And we do have a fair number of props. Um, I agree. So they, they do get, first off, I do a homework, homework every week. Um, and one of the things that I do is um, I use a spreadsheet, a fairly large spreadsheet, and I record everything that they give me. Um, and I look at trends. So I have the spreadsheet set up so that it's conditionally formatted so that if they give a correct answer, it's a yes and it's green and no. And then at the end of the row, it tells me how many people got this right or got that wrong. And that's one of the ways that I go back, I try and go back and say, okay, well, it's pretty clear that, you know, 75% of you guys didn't get this. So maybe we need to touch on this again. Um, I agree. Right, but, but, but let me stop you right there. Sure. When that student came to you and identified whatever part of the engine incorrectly, that student should not be able to move on to the next assessment until they successfully pass that first assignment. So it shouldn't be at the end of the semester, you're, you're like this one student just doesn't get it because that one student shouldn't be able to go on to the next module or the next objective until they get that one because everything should build upon each other scaffolding yeah. I, 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 okay your points well taken um i do my, my policy on the labs is is that you either do it or you don't and doing it for me means that you will repeat doing it until you can get it correct so that's why i try and do sort of on the spot assessments 
you know, here's the lab sheet, here's the things that you were going to do. Let's review it real quickly. Okay. Again, we got an issue here. Let's go back. And then I try and say, okay, well, that's not what you think it is. This is what you're looking for and try and correct it there and then hopefully do it. I mean, like I said, I don't know. Uh, I, I will say this, um, this particular course this past semester, um, you know, we've been on campus with students since fall of 20. We've had in-person labs for three or four hours at a clip with our students since fall of, of 20. Um, we finally went back to in-person lectures last semester. We were supposed to be remote. Uh, and even then remote for us means that we can't do it as a Zoom. I would literally record my lecture, put it up on Blackboard because I finished the lecture I live up in Harpers Ferry, West Virginia. It's an hour ride in. So I don't have enough time to, to, to do an in-person lecture and then drive down uh, and be there for the lab in 20 minutes. Plus, my students are in the same boat. I don't know where they're doing their getting their Zoom for. Um, I know they can do it out in the parking lot, but that doesn't always work for them. So we had to record it. Now, this particular student was in a class last semester it was a Friday night class. On the Friday night class, the original schedule was. Steve, I hate doing this to you, but I really I gotta go. address some. I don't sure. want to do it. Fun. It's great discussion, no, no, no. but I need to do some housekeeping before we leave. And when four o'clock comes, y'all are gonna want to leave. And plus, I got another got, session at four fifteen. No, I I, so, I um, talk to you. You understand? No, you're fine, Steve. You're one of my favorite people in this live long college, and you know that you are. So in the um in the attendance. I want to put this link in case anybody dropped in late and didn't take the attendance. Um, I want to also give you guys a link to complete a survey because we need to know how you all enjoyed um, our sessions. If you want us to be able to continue to offer these opportunities and so on, it'd be most helpful if we get your feedback. I want to make sure too, I'm going to put it on the screen for our takeaway website as well. So you have that. So you can see that takeaway website. You can scan it with your QR code. Um, I'll also put that link down there again for you guys. Um, because all the information we talked about about lessons and presentations are there. Thank you so much, Nahir. I appreciate you and all of you all. I loved your insights. I wish we had had longer because I really hated cutting off Steve. I wish we had, had longer um, to talk but I hope you guys got something out of it. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much.